Good members, I declare the meeting now open to the public online. I would like to uh, welcome members here today and to those who of our, our uh, panel who are participating online in order to allow us to maintain the social distancing requirements. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices, please? So, apologies. Um, any apologies there received? Uh, we think earlier, but that's, yeah. Cool. And, and Paula, sorry, we have received an, an apology from Paula as well, who's chairing them. We think they're both involved in APG meetings. So, um, just in terms of chairperson's business members, this week I attended two actually very interesting sessions of the NACON conference. The first one, myself and Colin did the meet the committee session, which was with the third sector, and a very good engagement with that sector, I have to say, um, and they were able to sort of put across a lot of their concerns and, and ask us how the committee would be uh, addressing those in the time ahead, and we indicated that while we have a very full schedule, we do we are very conscious of the contribution that that sector makes, and that we we will keep an eye out in terms of what, what it is that we can do of value in that regard. The second session was I had been asked to chair a social work panel in relation to inequality and poverty. And I have to say it was a fantastic panel. Uh, contributors from Scotland, contributors from England, a lot of very uh, involved people here in the system. And I have to say it was a very, very useful Broad agreement that the impacts of health, equality, health inequalities not only impacts individuals, impacts communities, but also impacts how our economy functions and everything else. So it's, it's a really a fundamental issue that we need to address. So that was a very interesting one for me as well. Um, I will just also, just for, for members who have arrived there late, uh, yeah, no, I'll go, I'll go ahead now over to the panel. So. Today's session is an evidence and a stakeholder evidence on the inquiry that we're carrying out into the impact of COVID-19 on care homes. Although we have gathered much evidence on care homes during the pandemic, this is the first time the committee's formal evidence session to since we agreed the terms of reference for our inquiry. I refer members to tab three there of your pack, and I would now like to welcome Ms. Linda Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of AJNA. Mr. Eddie Lynch, Commissioner for Older People for the North. Ms. Evelyn Hoy, Chief Executive uh, COPNA, Commissioner's Office. Sorry, we don't have Evelyn on the line, but we do have Ms. Emer Boyle, Head of Legal and Policy Advice in Copney. So I would now like to invite the Commissioner and the Chief Executive of AGNA to brief the meeting. So you're very welcome here this morning, um, Commissioner, and would you go ahead, I think it's yourself first, and then maybe we'll go to, we'll go to uh, Linda following. So go ahead, please, Commissioner. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? We're hearing you yep. loud and clear now, yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks to the Committee for the invitation uh, to provide evidence. Uh, to this mini inquiry, a very important uh, and welcome inquiry. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the committee for the important role that they have played during the pandemic in scrutinising uh, the various authorities um, on a, a whole range of issues. Um, as you say, I'm joined on the call today by uh, my head of legal and policy advice, uh, Emer Boyle. Um, I acknowledge the, the invitation from the committee outlines that the committee feels it has a good sense of the problems experienced to date in the pandemic and is very keen to um, come up with constructive recommendations to inform decision making going forward. Um, so I've tried to focus my evidence um, around the headings that the committee have provided, um, obviously with a key focus on the issues that I feel um, um, most, um, uh, you know, uh, most related to my role as Commissioner and the issues that I feel are, are more in line with the work of myself and my office. Um, before we start, I would like to just point out, uh, making the point that when we talk about care homes, we're talking about uh, the lives of 14,000 older people um, and that, that these 14,000 older people, this is their home that they live in. And they're not just one group of people, uh, they're, they're all individuals, they all have a wide range of needs, of views and hopes and wishes. Um, but we do have a duty um, uh, to protect their human rights, and I have a duty as Commissioner 
uh, to ensure that their rights are protected during this very difficult time. And that includes things like their rights to see family members and to be cared for and treated with respect uh, and dignity. I also confirmed to the committee that I will be providing a full uh, written submission um, by the, the 19th of October as requested. <clears throat> and just making a few points um, that I believe are important points to make initially um, to the committee today. Um, in, in terms of first the issue of discharge from hospital settings to care homes, um, my office was contacted by families uh, at the start of this pandemic saying that this had happened to them and as a result of that, uh, their relatives um, did become unwell. So we have worked closely with families and authorities on this issue, obviously highlighting the danger of this. And I think going forward, it should be very clear that nobody should be discharged and placed in a home before being tested and, and proven to be a negative test for COVID going forward. The risk is simply too high for the others in the home. In terms of uh, access to PPE, uh, members will know that at the start of this pandemic, um, the, the, the levels of access were not adequate for many of the independent providers and I had many calls with them and officials um, in the early stages. For many weeks, care home providers couldn't get uh, access to sufficient PPE and this, that continued to be an, uh, an issue really up to late April uh, and, and er, into early May. So that's something that um, has to be addressed going forward, it is being addressed I believe um, at this stage but it's something that we need to keep focus on, we need to make sure there's security of supply of PPE. Um, it's something that care home providers should be provided with free of charge for the foreseeable future until we have a review of their tariff. Um, and I, I don't believe there are any excuses as we enter the autumn and winter uh, for us not to ensure that homes this time round, um, as we face the second wave, do not have uh, shortages of PPE. And I think that the other point in relation to PPE is the need to make sure that staff in the homes are properly trained in, turn, in terms of donning and doffing PPE so it's, it's done uh, correctly. The other big issue is testing in care homes. Um, as we know, there was no testing at all in the early months of the pandemic uh, for care home residents or staff. Um, in fact, it was only in, by the end of July where we had saw every home being tested. Um, the current testing regime is 14 days for each uh, a test for every 14 days for staff members and every 28 days for residents. Um, however, the, the department and the minister has uh, stated in, in the past that if community transmission was to increase um, and that they would re-look at this and, and look at the regularity of testing. And I do believe now that we're faced um, with significant increases in community transmission, that now is the time to look at the regularity of testing again. And I, so now at this stage, I'm really calling on uh, testing for care home staff, particularly to be increased to once a week. I, I think that is uh, an action that's really needed now. Um, they are, these are the people who are coming in and out of the homes on a very regular basis. And I think as community trans, transmission increases, it's important to be increase the rate of testing. I've also heard some issues around delays to testing uh, for care home staff. Um, some care homes have reported um, tests haven't been come back for four to eight days. Um, and that's something I also believe needs to be addressed. And we also need to look at testing for visitors and potential care partners um, in, in care homes going forward as well. In terms of funding and increased costs for care homes, it's clear the pandemic is increasing costs for care home providers. Um, I recognise that there has been an 11.9 million support package to help with certain areas, but I'm advised by some care home providers this has not always been straightforward. So I do think we also need to see additional funding put in place to facilitate safe visiting during the next six months and beyond. Um, you know, this is a sector that has been advising me and others for many years that it was not sustainable at the current care tariff. And I think a cost, a review of the cost of care has been long overdue before this pandemic. And I think it has highlighted yet again the need for that to take place. Um, in terms of staffing issues and levels, I think I would make a couple of comments around staffing. Again, I believe that uh, care homes do need additional resources, both 
financial and staffing uh, to be able to organise and manage, particularly visiting and care homes um, as we go forward. The most recent guidance from the Department on visiting has presented homes with many uh, challenges. Um, there are also, I understand, some restrictions on staff working across market, uh, multiple homes, which will possibly increase further pressure on some providers as well. And it's vital that staff receive training um, on the operations of a home and any additional COVID measures in, in, in place. And really, time is of the essence with this issue because we are facing into a, a potentially very difficult second wave. So we need to get these measures working as well as possible very quickly indeed. Um, I just touched on staff pay and conditions. That was another issue that, that the committee raised. Um, my Home Truths report into Dunmore Manor Care Home issued a number of recommendations on uh, care home staff and how we treat them. Um, there has been a real pressure for care homes on the availability of particularly nurses in many areas. Um, and there, there are problems with retaining staff and having large amounts of agency staff. Many homes have reported that in the past. But I think the issue is that the broader issue here is caring for older people uh, in care homes is a very difficult job, which is still not properly valued and, and people doing that job aren't paid to the level that they should be. And I think we all have a duty to ask ourselves as a society, um, is, it how, is this how we value the role and jobs of those who care for our older relatives? Is, is this really an okay situation? The reality of the pandemic here is that it saw 17, 18, 19 year olds being required to go into care homes without proper protection on many occasions to look after the most vulnerable. And I think we all have a duty to make sure we look at that issue going forward and better value the staff who play that key role. Just a comment on visiting. Um, maintaining, co maintaining contact with relatives in care home settings is essential for many families in Northern Ireland. And since the re release of restrictions, uh, this has caused huge issues uh, and the revised guidance has in some ways given families hope and sometimes false hope that they would see their, their relatives and loved ones more often. Um, it is the biggest concern being brought to my office at present. Um, many families are deeply concerned about still not being able to visit their loved ones. Many of them actually more concerned about that than actually COVID itself. Um, because many families have seen the negative detrimental impact that has um, uh, you know that they've seen their loved ones really deteriorate over a period of months and they do believe strongly that that lack of, of social contact has played a part in that so going forward it's it's not easy but we need to facilitate some form of safe visiting that allows um, the older people in care homes the chance to see their family members and vice versa and we need to do everything in our power to make sure that that happens just in closing uh, chair um, in terms of the support from the trusts and advanced care planning, um, I understand from officials that the, the Health and Social Care Trusts have been providing assistance to care homes, um, virtual ward rounds, the likes of that have been happening. Um, whether that's sustainable in the longer term remains to be seen. seen. But um, in terms of advanced care planning, I think it's deeply, it's very important that these conversations are handled sensitively between the clinician and the family and next of kin. It's not appropriate that a family member is asked this question for the first time when they have become um, un unwell and need hospital treatment. So that's something that should be uh, thought of it in advance because clearly COVID has had a de devastating impact on our care home population. Um, but it's also important to point out that many older people have survived this. Many have um, contracted COVID and come out the other side. And I think that's something that we also have to remember even though those in care home settings, many of them have survived COVID. Uh, and that's a message that we quite often don't hear as well. And in conclusion, really, my team and I have been involved in many meetings with the different authorities on, on these matters in recent weeks. Uh, it is clear that there is much planning and preparation has gone on within the health and social care system. Um, the only point I would make at this, at this stage would be, um, it's not always clear to me how some of the plans and some of the guidance will be implemented on the ground. So I think that is the challenge uh, going forward, that we make sure that the, the guidance produced at this time for all the authorities, and particularly the care home providers, that we produce guidance that is realistic, 
that's implementable on the ground and that can have a, uh, make a real difference for families and residents in care homes themselves. So thank you and I'm very happy to take any questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you very much, um, Commissioner, for that very a detailed range of responses that's, and some very interesting information there. So, listen, we will come back to you. I think we'll, we'll ask Linda to do her presentation and then we'll come back with questions to each or either of you then at that point. So, could I ask you there, Linda, to go ahead and brief the committee this morning or this afternoon, please? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for the opportunity to speak uh, to the Health Committee today on what is a very important issue. Uh, our contribution, a bit like the Commissioner, will follow some of the um, sets that were, were distributed in the letter and um, certainly we would um, fall in behind what the Commissioner has said in many of those areas so I won't necessarily cover them again in detail because I think Eddie's done it um, certainly in a way that we fully support and would recognise as well. Um, our insights are very much based on the experiences of older people and I, I, just, I know um, members of the committee will have been issued with uh, this document um, through an email system in terms of the lived experiences um, and if not we can send that back out again to you but it was very much an opportunity for us to hear um, the voices of older people over the last six months in terms of the experiences of COVID and in particular as of today in terms of the uh, residential and nursing sector. In addition we'll also um, have some feedback uh, in the form of written submission uh, again, we know that's to be with you for the 19th, and that will give you more detail around some of the, the points that I might like to share with you this, this afternoon. Uh, in terms of that lived experience, uh, we were um, up, uh, delighted that we were able to have the opportunity to gather um, through various means the, the comments of people in terms of an evidence gathering, because I think today is very much about gathering the evidence of what went very well. Uh, in terms of supporting people, but also where the challenges are and where the learning can come from. And I think we've been able to um, be able to gather that and hopefully support the committee as they go forward. Uh, one of the big areas, of course, has been around the, the issue of visiting in, in care homes. Um, it's challenging for residents, challenging for staff, challenging for, resi uh, sorry, for relatives and families. And I suppose the balance of that is the, the individual and that collective within a home that is the person's home. Um, so we're very supportive of looking at a way that will bring compassion and judgment to the situation of why we do visiting in the future. Um, and you know, at the moment, the guidance is a struggle for some people, and we understand that from some of the feedback we get that the one visit, uh, you know, an hour um, a week by the same person, whilst it's been able to manage, I suppose, from the home's point of view, certainly families feel that maybe a bit more of the judgment around that could be exercised. And what I mean by that in terms of that compassion and judgment is that particularly for older people with dementia, it might be better to support a visit a couple of times a week. So that would be split down into two half hours um, and, and then therefore managed out across um, obviously families um, who, are, who are in particular caring for people with dementia. So what, I suppose what we're saying is that the one size maybe doesn't all fit all. And I know guidance has that sort of collective responsibility, but the compassion in that and the enabling in that, this is something that I, I would like to see uh, and going forward. Um, and I know what's been talked about has been the, um, the term a care partner. Um, and certainly is there the possibility to explore um, the role of families and relative committees as supporting that role of the, the visiting uh, routine. Because um, at the moment, our care staff who are you know, doing a tremendous job of divide, providing direct care on the ground, will have to obviously come away from the floor in order to manage and supervise the process of making sure people are, are, are properly um, protected in terms of PPE and, and then with the guidance. But we wonder, is there a, a more enhanced role for families? That means that they are involved in the process, that they are provided with the appropriate PPE, and that... Um, you know, a, a small group of the relatives committees could manage that process of supporting the visiting right across the home sector. Now, I recognise that needs a bit more work, but there's, there's, uh, you know, um, a possibility of enabling people to feel assured and reassured in terms of how they visit their families, a bit of compassion around that. And also what we're wanting to promote is that, you know, we all recognise that we are partners in care. 
uh, that being the nursing and the care home, the trust's involvement, pressure's involvement, our involvement as, 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 a, as a charity organisation, and just that more general view of relatives' involvement as well, uh, supporting each other. So uh, that was just one that we wanted to pose. Is there a possibility to explore that um, and look at how that compassion can be added to it? Um, we also recognise there's a large piece of work to be done in, uh, in relation to bereavement, um, not just with family members who have had um, obviously someone that um, has been bereaved through COVID, but also residents uh, and staff members who, in the um, height of this pandemic, you know, we could see it daily on television and we heard it on radio, we observed it, but from a distance and I wonder how we and can we capture in a way that supports those groups of people who have been directly bereaved. Uh, you know, the impact of a home losing uh, a number of residents over a very small period of time, the impact of that sort of empty nest within the home over other residents, families. Uh, and I just wonder, you know, what is our feeling on going forward with a, with a bereavement service that will tackle that adequately? Um, and also takes on board the uh, the bespoke nature of of it being linked to a pandemic, being linked to the restrictions that we had at that time in terms of how we dealt with bereavement, but also not forgetting the experience of care staff who were facing that day in and day out, and relatives who were on the outside having to view that. So we think that that's a very a very important area as well. And as as Eddie had mentioned, there social care workforce. For some time, um, you know, we have been sort of wanting to push that agenda, um, highlighting that the social care framework has been broken, fully supportive of transformation. But part of that transformation has to be a recognition of value and being valued for the social care workforce. That workforce has predominantly um, uh, you know, supported and catered for the needs of those needing social care. Um, and whilst this committee, I know, is focusing on the nursing, um, nursing and care home agenda, many of those care staff work within a framework that would not just work across homes, but also work across community settings. Uh, and I think, you know, we've got to, uh, also to remember that a significant portion of our older population, and indeed those with other conditions at any age, are supported by a social care workforce in the community. Um, and it's important that I think that whole, um, um, that whole section of the workforce the training, the value, the terms and conditions are all part of what will make us a success going forward with, with social care. And it's about that being valued and being partners in care. The lived experience has also um, wanted us to make sure that we are protecting the rights of older people, of course, throughout this, the human rights um, of those that um, may not have a voice for themselves and equally making sure that the voice of those that have and have the capabilities and capacity to make sure that those voices are heard. And a little bit about the lived experience, you'll find that in, in reading and indeed in our submission. Um, the wraparound health and social care, I suppose, is the other piece of the jigsaw that we think is important. And what I mean by that is that there's a number of uh, professionals in terms of health and wellbeing going in and out of, of the care sector, particularly the nursing home sector. And we just wanted to make sure that that GP and healthcare service was tightly wrapped around it, working as one team. Um, I know some of the concerns that came to our door was the view that of GPs weren't able to visit, that uh, home staff had to take a picture and then send it to the, to, the, to, the, to the surgery. And we felt that going forward, surely there's a better way to do that. If people are going in and out in terms of their nursing staff um, from the trusts, PPE staff, infection control staff, then can we get that that role of the GP back and engaged because I think it's a vital service for the general well-being, the general emotional and physical well-being of, of patients and also to support the nursing managers that are there as well. Um, and I suppose that the final bit um, for us is all around the regulation and there, there has been the, the discussions around the role of RQIA and we think that that very much is a quality assurance role because it does give confidence to all and perhaps the focus um, could be more on the observations of the quality of life, the observations of the care practice, the observations of the PPE, and perhaps during a, height, a heightened time of crisis, um, we, we move how we do our paper trails and our record, records 
of inspection and focus on what we see in front of us and is that a better way to um, use the expertise and the skills that the inspector can bring to these matters. And I suppose just to finish um, from our point of view, Claire, um, it's very much about the communication of all that. Um, we're working very closely as teams, as uh, Eddie and, and, and Emer, um, the trusts um, and the department, to make sure that, that this surge that is, is uh, upon us um, works better for older people, works better for those that need support, works better for families. And that's all about the communication, I think, around that and about us all being viewed as partners in care. And I buy it, I mean, by that all sectors and, you know, to make sure that the independent, the statutory and the private and voluntary are all seen as partners. And that at the heart of that will be the older people and their carers in terms of family members that, you know, what we decide has to make sure that it works for them in terms of human rights, quality of life, because that has to go on. We, we have to make sure that that's protected, particularly um, as we go into another phase uh, over the next six months. And that's about, um, I suppose, taking on board the rapid learning initiatives that were taking place through the trusts and that that is very quickly fed into practice and that we are all supportive of that and work together. Um, and I think a lot of work has been done on that um, field. I know, uh, I'm sure Eddie and Emer will, will uh, agree with me that um, over this last couple of months, a lot more has been coming together. And I think that that's good. It's good for our health and social care. It's good for the visibility uh, in terms of what residents and families see as um, a trusted force going forward. And I think the, the core to that would be really good tight communications that we all understand and, and, can, and can support. Thank you. Okay, thank you both very much. Um, both very, very interesting. Um, a couple, I suppose, questions just from me and then I go to members. But. Um, Eddie, you, you spoke at the start there, uh, or early on, in relation to the whole testing issue. And I know the committee had been um, extremely focused on this in, in the early stages, and we did welcome very much when the testing programme was rolled out. And it was interesting to me, recently in the, in the Assembly Chamber, the Minister did indicate that as a result of the testing programme within the care home settings, that a number of, quite a large number of the cases had been picked up asymptomatically. So before they were picked up before people were showing symptoms, and I think that is something to be welcomed. And uh, indeed, it may, it may flag up potentially other approaches in terms of the wider health and social care workforce. But anyway, we, we'll continue to focus. Um, on, on, on the care homes in this section, but what's your impression, of, uh, Commissioner, of the rollout and the effectiveness of the testing regime at the moment? And also then, and this is for either or both of you as well, what, that, what the impact of that testing potentially is on residents, then, as a, maybe, maybe that's to you, Linda. So first of all, Eddie, in relation to your experience of the rollout, where is it at at present? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think what you're saying is correct. I mean, obviously, in the early days of this, we didn't have any testing, and it was something that myself and, and, and the committee and others were calling for, and um, it, it was very welcome when that was introduced. Um, at the time, I had some concerns with regard to the regularity of testing only being every couple of weeks for staff. Um, but at the time, the department and minister were very clear that that would be kept under review. Um, and if we saw, um, you remember when this was brought in, we, it was a time when we were starting to see less cases in the community. So there was a clear um, understanding and, and um, commitment given there that if we saw an increase in transmission of the virus in the community, that would be reviewed. And I think when we see the figures that are, have been coming out in the past number of days and, and weeks, it is clear that um, the levels of of spread in the community have increased uh, to a much uh, higher level, unfortunately. And I think in that situation, um, we, need, we do need to be now looking at the care workers, the nurses who are living in the community, who are coming in and out every day. And I think we, that's why we need to up the testing to at least week, weekly. I mean, I've had a number of calls with experts, virologists um, on this issue. Um, it's clear that the testing has been working quite well. I mean, the authorities are saying it's, it's, it's actually caught a number of cases, and as, as you say, asymptomatic cases. But I do think we just need to ramp it up some more because um, 
some of the experts have clearly said 14 days is, is too big a gap, that there's there's definitely more scope for you not catch, catching the virus in between uh, those tests when people become effective. So it's trying to recognise there's no perfect answer here, um, but I think moving from twice weekly uh, to weekly for care workers would be an appropriate response to the level of risk um, we're currently seeing. Thank you. And uh, Linda, in terms of the impact of, of testing on residents, what would your experience be from, from yeah. HNA's perspective? Certainly, uh, I think what we can't lose in all of this, obviously, Chair, would be the consent issue. And, and I think um, we've also got to recognise that the staff on the ground and the families will know residents best and can, as, as Eddie was saying, there's support that achievement of delivering that model of testing. Um, and I think, you know, it's very important that if that's as, and we are, you know, following the, the advice of our experts in terms of their science and, and medicine, and if that's the approach, I think we've got to make it happen. Um, but we've got to make sure that we support the home who would be probably the hub of delivering that uh, in a timely way and allowing, you know, that's about that whole workforce plan around how can we enable that to happen? And that might be increased um, increased staff on duty to make sure that it's done effectively if we're, if we're reducing it down in terms of the, the time. Um, you know, in small homes of 20 people, that might be fine. But we must remember that a lot of our homes are 70 bedded, you know, 100 bedded homes. So the time it takes in order to deliver the testing, because it's not straightforward if you're dealing with people who are probably advanced levels of dementia, the whole, you know, have we got consent right? And also just making sure that our staff are comfortable delivering the tests. If we can, you know, capture that in a way that is efficient and effective, then I think we will see the benefits of, of a testing programme, as, as Eddie said, there in nursing homes and care homes. Thank you. OK, then, just going on to the issue of, of visiting. Um, on the one hand, the committee has heard evidence from uh, that in, in Hong Kong, the deaths in care homes was kept to around 30 to 40 um, in a population, uh, a total population of 7.5 million. But this was achieved by restricting all visits in person and we have also heard evidence over the course of the pandemic of the uh, huge impact on mental health. So I wonder, could either or both of you elaborate further on how we should seek to balance the impact on residents of restricted visiting with trying to prevent further infections in home? I think, uh, oh, do you want me to go first there? No, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I think what we have, um, I, I think it's a very difficult question that we're all, I mean, you know, countries around the world are trying to get the, the correct answer to that. And, you know, we're trying to balance compassion um, and the fact that many, many homes um, obviously didn't have COVID and many people will say that was because of the, the you know, the, the cancellation of visiting. But there's lots of other things that can make that the case. I think to lose the, the value of families supporting relatives at a very difficult time and supporting staff because that's the other um, important aspect of this, that if it's just purely staff in the home, um, constantly having that 24 hour guard of, of their PPE, of making sure that the, the, the residents' wellbeing in general um, um, is, is, is looked after, then we've got to support people to do that. And it is the balance between the individual and that collective response and the responsibility that we all feel of protecting people. But I think what, what we have, have probably found in the last six months is that there was a lot of sort of detrimental um, impacts for families and for residents. And, we, and, and again, you know, we've all seen those. And, and I think we can find a way to make it work. Uh, and I think that people, the, the people generally, particularly carers, family carers, and I know you'll be hearing from people over the next week, Chair, on that, will tell you that we've got to find a better way to make sure that the health and well-being of residents, because social care and social contact and being connected with those you know, who we care for uh, is so important. And um, I think it would be remiss of us not to at least try ways. And, you know, we, we, we might put forward there the potential of exploring the role of the family carers in supporting that caring um, rota. Um, and I'm, you know, we might find that, you know, that uh, when it's explored that it isn't ideal, but we've, I think we've got to look at ways that make it um, 
the Northern Ireland experience and the design of nursing and care homes in Northern Ireland is very different to other parts of the world and, and, and to Singapore. And I think countries have to find a measure that meets the needs of their communities. Uh, and I think that's what we're striving for here. And I still think there is great benefit in making sure that people are still connected and that we have the appropriate measures PP in place and that, that we, we've got to make sure that families are supplied with that um, when they enter the home to make sure that it's the same type of PPE for us all uh, and that it's at, it's at the best quality and grade to put as much protection into it. We also have of, looked at innovation where some homes have been able to divide up rooms and put barriers in them so that the physical presence is there and it's still the, you know, they're still not able to sort of have that touching rule. Uh, and I think those are measures that we should all explore. But what we do understand about that is that that has to be resourced. And I think um, that, you know, we've looked at the issue of virtual visiting. And I think to a slight, you know, to a point that that's been very positive and very good, but nothing beats eye to eye contact and that feeling that you're in the room with someone who is cared for very deeply by a family member. And I think we've got to make ways to make that happen. And, and do you think that are you, are, you, are you suggesting, uh, are you suggesting Linda, that, that PPE is provided to allow socially distanced and visits to take place? Absolutely. I think we've got to enable people uh, um, and have the compassion there to support homes. Now, I know a lot of homes will be doing that already, um, and it seems to be working um, from what I hear, and certainly the evidence to us. And I think if we can make sure that that's regulated in terms of the, the PPE that is delivered to homes, and that we have um, someone who is um, trained, and, and it doesn't have to. I, I mean, I mean, our view is it doesn't have to be the care worker always having to come off the floor where they are providing much needed support to the rest of the residents. A very well trained, you know, member of the families committee could do that job very well with with enough uh, support from the infection control teams that are going in out of homes at the minute when they're needed to make sure that it's been delivered correctly within the framework that we're asking people at the minute when they go in and out of a lot of public spaces about their track and trace. You know, people are delivering uh, at a very high standard and I think we can deliver a model with a little bit of exploration. That means with PEEP, right, PPE, people can get in and out, recognising social distance and recognising all the rules that go with that as well. But I think we could get it to a way that could be explored that supports I do believe um, perhaps down to two half hour visits a week, which supports people with dementia in the journey. You know, a full week with no family support is, is tough and it's tough for family carers as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll go across now then to members with questions and I'll go first to Jay. Thanks, Jay, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thanks everybody for, for your points. Um, I think it is important, as you said, that we have this discussion, and thanks for your input. Um, I suppose most of my comments is, are probably directed towards Eddie, the Commissioner, um, in regards to Romwood Homes and the Murray Manor sort of, um, in particular. And I, I was there in, I think it was June 2018, uh, when you released your report. And I am quite uh, concerned that there's been a repeated uh, issues around Romwood Homes uh, at different levels, the Murray Manor, um, Clifton, um, and I, I would like to ask a comment from yourself whether you think that that particular provider um, would be fit for purpose to uh, continue getting contracts. And for me, there's enough concerns that uh, this, this should be uh, seriously reviewed. Um, so that, that's the, the first point. Um, and also in relation to Dunmurray Manor, it's been brought to my attention that uh, staff are, are still trying to whistleblow. Uh, but they're they're frightened, they're concerned, possibly about their, their livelihoods and, and their jobs. So I think there's still a massive question around that particular provider. Uh, and some people seem to have a, a, an idea that if it, had, if it wasn't elderly people, then maybe this uh, type of action may not be, be happening. Um, and it really brings into focus when you see the, um, the news yesterday around Four Seasons, obviously, putting their car homes up for sale. So it's something that I've been banging on about for, for months and, and longer, about the, the for-profit uh, model of, of car homes is, is not fit for purpose, in my view. So maybe a, a response uh, to some of those points, uh, Commissioner, if, if you would, that would be helpful. Thank you. But just, just before you go to that, Commissioner, I do want to point out this session is specifically designed to look into the general situation in relation to COVID. 
in care homes and uh, I, I am aware that that's our focus so you can take that into consideration when you're considering how you answer that question. Okay, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Jerry, for the, the questions. Um, I mean, you raise uh, certainly important issues, and you know, issues that myself and my team have been continuing to you know work on since the the Dunmore Manor investigation and the Home Truths report. These issues continue to come, unfortunately, come to my office on a regular basis, and you know, you're quite right in pointing out that. Um, in, in recent times, um, there have been issues around uh, Dunmore Manor, which is now Oak Tree Manor, uh, Clifton House, uh, Glen Abbey. Um, and my office has been involved in, in working with both family members and actually um, workers from those homes on those issues. So in our sort of normal work, we continue to liaise with the authorities on those matters as we would with any care home. Um, but obviously it is disappointing to see, um, again, similar care homes um, experiencing problems again a number of years on from those investigations. And, and the issues that, that the Home Truths report highlighted are still need to be followed up. And I would say just generally that, that there is a need for a lot of those recommendations to be progressed if we're going to remain to tackle those, those issues. Because the issues that we are here now, unfortunately, uh, many of them are the same issues that we had before before COVID. Um, so that, that would be my response to that. And certainly, you know, I, I, it is something I have raised with the authorities. If, if there are, is, if, if there's any, any provider that um, is clearly um, has, has, has had shortcomings or failures of care over multiple homes, I, I do believe that's something that the authorities um, need to be looking at as well and considering more in the round as opposed to just um, on, on a single home basis. Um, just a couple of points, Chair, just on the visiting issue, just to go on what Linda had said. I mean, I think it is a it is a balance we have to strike. It's a very difficult balance, but I think what I would say on the visiting issue is that there is more evidence now that there wasn't at the start of this pandemic about the impact that that um, lack of visiting um, is having. But also, we're in a different position. In March, we had homes without PPE. We had no testing system in place. Um, so at that stage, it was seen that the, the best way was to lock down those homes from anyone who didn't have to be in there. I think now we're seeing um, that there is a detrimental impact on those people's um, physical, mental and emotional well-being. So we're balancing the right to protect life with the right to have a family life. And I think it's really important that we work together to create a condition where we can have some sort of safe visiting going forward. It would be, I believe, inhumane to just have a blanket ban on visiting for the next six to nine months. We're dealing with many people who this is the last months of their lives, and um, it, it would be a cruel system to impose that. Um, and uh, you know, as I said previously, this is something many, many families have come to my office seeking help and support. The problem is that the latest guidance is good in many ways, and paper it allows. Uh, for more flexibility around visiting, but I can't um, uh, stress enough the need for more work to be done between the authorities, the providers and the families to work on this system. Um, I think it can be done. Um, providers are coming forward with the ideas and recommendations, things like outdoor you know, plastic pods that can be put in place that can enable safe visiting and easy cleaning. I think there, there are the sorts of innovations we need to be looking at because this isn't something that's going to be gone in a month or two. We are potentially looking at this being another year or longer. So I think we do need to put in those longer term um, plans in place that will enable older people not just to be, have their life protected, but that they can continue to have um, some quality of life. And part of that is to see their fam families. Thank you, Sadie. And, and just in, we have talked about the, the balance between visiting and protecting residents from COVID-19, but have we got the balance right in terms of the, autom the autonomy of private care home providers, um, their autonomy and the provision of Article 8 rights and, and uh, the guidance? So has that balance, in your view, uh, been appropriately managed? Well, I think, I think that the, all of this is, you know, these are testing times um, 
for the, the whole the whole industry. I think we've never experienced anything like this before, and I think that um, there's never been a time. We hear the term co-production talked about a lot, and I think there's never been a time more more so than now that the the authorities and the providers and the families all have to work together in, in a spirit of cooperation to see what can be done. As, as Linda pointed out, you know, we need to have compassion here. We need to recognize the risks. We need to have that sort of clinical analysis and, and the protection and the PPE and the testing. But we also have to remember that this is, the, 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 the care homes are people's homes. Um, these are people with lives who deserve um, as good a quality of life, life as possible. And we all have the challenge to try to get through this. There's no perfect solution. There's no risk-free solution here. Um, but we, we can't simply just say we, we shut these people away and, um, and, and in many ways forget about them. That is, that is something that's just not, uh, in my view, uh, a sustainable option. Now, families have been very clear. Um, the vast majority of families are, are really desperate to have some sort of system in place that allows that contact to continue. And that's where the focus should be now. Without taking our eyes off the PPE, without taking our eyes off the testing regime, all of that is absolutely vital uh, and remains vital. But we have to complement it with some sort of compassion and visiting regime as well. Okay, thank you. Going now to Pat Sheehan. Okay, thanks, and thanks to all the panel for your contribution today. And I'm just wondering whether any analysis has been carried out as to why some care homes uh, perhaps performed better than others. Uh, maybe that's not the best way to put it, but I'm sure you get the gist of what I mean. Uh, some care homes may have had more PPE. Uh, they may have been using less agency staff, you know, suggestion that homes that used more agency staff were more likely to have uh, transmissions, uh, particularly with agency staff who worked in multiple care homes. You had the issue of, uh, of visiting, uh, admissions criteria, what, what criteria were care homes using to admit uh, residents from the community? All of those different issues, and not all care homes, I presume, took the same approach to all of those different issues. So I'm just wondering, has any analysis been carried out, or is there any plans for some analysis to be carried out in the future? Thanks. Thank you. And over to our panel. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think that's probably a question, Pat, for um, maybe the department and, and some of the authorities who have the, the data on, on these issues. Certainly, we, um, you know, we would be asking for information on the number of homes that have outbreaks. Um, and we understand that the authorities would be doing an analysis of, um, you know, the outbreaks that are happening and, you know, the extent that they're happening. Um, where they're happening as well, you know, I think that's an issue as well, linked to local um, uh, transmission rates. Um, but I, I suppose w one point I would make is that uh, just because a home doesn't ha gets an outbreak um, doesn't necessarily mean that that home, you know, has been at fault. I mean, I think this is what's been proven is this has been a very, it is a very different, difficult um, virus to control. Um, it is very difficult. Um, to keep it out of care homes when you have so many people coming in and out, particularly the staff, and that's why the testing has been so important. Um, but at the minute, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not aware of any, any significant analysis. You know, there has been talk about you know inquiries looking back on this um, down the line. But I, I, my focus, I suppose, in the last few months has been um, about the learning from the start of this pandemic and and where there has been failings and how we can learn very quickly because we all know that we are now at the at the at this um second surge and it is a deeply worrying time for us all but obviously particularly for those most vulnerable and obviously the, the figures bear that out that you know um almost half of the victims of this virus um first time around were people living in care homes so um, it is. I, I, I have to I have to say that this is a very big challenge for the homeowners themselves. I think you know this is, you know, uh, 
there has been a lot of extra um, work and activity that's been required at the, the, the providers level to um, put these situations in place. Um, I think obviously, as we saw with Dunmurray Manor and other homes in the past, it doesn't help if but high turnover of staff. You know, you're having to train people up and make them aware of how the home runs. But I, I do think that the providers um, also need support. They need support in terms of resources and capacity um, to manage what will be a very difficult winter. Um, and I think um, in, also in terms of the visiting, as I said, they do need extra support there if they're going to be able to facilitate the safe visiting guidelines that families so desperately want. Linda, anything from you on that, or will I go on ahead to? I think, well, well uh, Chair, it's just, you know, those points are important that it's not, you know, we're dealing with a, with a, with a population of, of, of homes that are different sizes, different locations, different staffing rotas, and I think there's a lot of variables that when we look back for learning, we'll see that um, the impact of the virus was, for a lot of us at the time, in March and April, when we look back, I think, um, there's a lot of variables have, have been sort of the source of the outbreaks and, and I think the Commissioner's right in saying, you know, that there's a lot, I mean, just as it was in hospitals, you know, lots of things have been put in place and the virus has, has gone through some very, very good solid systems, um, but we're learning all the time and I think that's important um, and to sort of reduce the, the amount of areas that um, the potential for a virus to, to move into. Um, can be, but at, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that we make sure that these are people's homes um, and that we protect them in their homes. Okay, thank you. Okay, going then to Pam. Thank you, Chair, um, thank you, Linda and, and Eddie, for your presentations for the committee today. Um, a lot of the questions have already been asked and answered, but in, in terms of the uh, staffing turnovers in, in homes, and this, you may not be the right people to be asking about this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, are, are you concerned um, about staff shortages heading into this second wave, especially now that we have the Stop COVID NI app and the risk of uh, you getting that ping, as we call it, which basically knocks you off the grid for 14 days? And, and are you aware if staff are being advised um, to turn off their Bluetooth when they're going to work, if they know there's COVID cases um, in those particular homes? I don't know if you, you know the answers to any of those questions, but I would just be interested on, yeah. on hearing if you do. Just, just, bef just before you, you answer there, could I ask everyone who's, on, who's online to mute their phones if you're not, if you're not speaking? We're getting some uh, background noise coming through. So if everyone would just check your phones on mute there just before we go back to Linda. Okay, Linda, we'll try that. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think there is, um, I think there's a great fear in the social care workforce, um, uh, obviously heightened over the last six months when people, we were, we were asking people to go in and out of, of situations which were putting them at risk and then putting their families at risk. And I think that has a knock-on effect in terms of recruitment. Before this, um, we had been saying, um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that the whole you know, social care workforce piece needs urgently reviewed. Um, and I know that some work has been done, but we're still today in a situation of a model that was developed actually probably 30 years ago, whenever we moved into mixed economies of care and social care. Um, and that model isn't fit for today. We need to have a, a service that a, a, you know, a bit like what we have in terms of our nursing progression. Uh, we have a social care workforce career progression that will encourage people, encourage the workforce. If we look at our workforce at the minute in terms of an age profile, it tends to be an older age profile um, that is then found in social care. We need to encourage people coming out of universities um, and who are in that social care field to feel that this is a, this is a very value and valuable and caring profession. Oh. And I think we do that by structuring the workforce and structuring the career paths to show the value. And, uh, you know, I think that that is so important and it's part of that resourcing because what we've got to look at past six months is what happens for the next 10 to 20 years. The majority of the social care workforce is in the community dealing with domiciliary care. 
that's equally gapped at the minute, as is in terms of nursing and residential. The pressures on nursing and residential when a staff member doesn't come in is that, obviously, apart from the regulated staffing that you must have um, in terms of that inspector report, it's also the extra additional pressures that you put on to that workforce for the there and then when a member of staff doesn't turn up. So I think we've been mixed by the fear. I think we were short in terms of numbers in the first place. Uh, and I think that can be helped and eased by getting a very, very rapid review of social care in terms of the workforce planning, move from where it is at the minute, right out into the practice and get it, just get it happening uh, and get people feeling that this is, I mean, these are highly skilled members of the staff teams. I can tell you from when social care was first brought in and it would have come out of the old, old home health service where it was much more social care. Our care staff today aren't just doing social care. They're doing practices which would have traditionally been held in hospitals, you know, which um, is a very different role, very skilled role with a lot of training. And I think that well, that isn't recognised. And I think by doing that, we can start to look at how we start to fill those gaps because that's what we've got to do because it won't happen overnight. We've got to have a, a career path in, in mind that will, will move people to this sector, that they want to come to this sector, that they want to work with older people, that there's you know, a level of quality of life for everyone by enhancing that, 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 so that connection. Okay, thank you. Um, Can I come back? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Could I just ask you to, um, do you consider there to be a, a role for volunteering um, in the midst of pandemic? Um, and it, we've heard stories of, of relatives who actually volunteered in care settings. It, well, to be useful and, and to do that volunteering role, but also to give them access so that they could actually see their relatives? Is that something? Yeah. So um, I would be aware that um, many, many families will continually, would, would have continually done that sort of visiting role that they would, particularly, uh, you know, particularly around meal times, whenever, you know, the, with the best will in the world, sometimes that family care just knows how to support someone if they have problems with swallow or eating. Um, and just they, they have lived that longer experience of caring for someone. And I think families do have a role. I think they have a role in this care partnership. We just have to explain what we mean by a care partner, I think. But I'm not, you know, it's it has its place. And I think it has its place most at that visiting connection where people can spend time together and that the the direct care the um, the support that's needed around the medications the, you know the the moving and handling uh, and the whole delivery of care in the home site that's where we need our trained staff to be delivering but we take those staff away if we need them to be uh, observing and sitting in on visiting and i think there's a, an excellent role a real good quality compassionate role for those family carers to take charge of that piece of this partnership it has to be done right needs explored needs you know obviously needs to be revised and tightened down but i think that's an ideal rule that families would um take on very willingly because it's connecting them with the home the residents of course and, and their role in supporting care and i think it also will strengthen some of the um, some of the views I think some people may have around nursing homes that they're, you know, people go into nursing homes and are shut off. We want to be engaged. It's a community. Um, it's a home. Um, I think volunteers have, volunteer family members have a very strong role in that, that, that side of it. And just briefly, just to finish with you, Linda, should that care partnership, should that be more than one family member, in your opinion? I think that's where the judgment and the, um, that's that's really around the judgment. Our regulations at the minute, and we've set them out for a reason so that we all follow. And I think I, I fully understand that. But sometimes there needs to be a bit of judgment. And I know whenever we use the judgment, homes will perhaps interpret that in different ways. But I think we've got to get a model that works for the individual. And if we're, if we're true about person-centered care and individual care, then we've got to have a bit of judgment around it, that it's safe practice and that that practice is compassionate and well-led. And by doing that, bringing those family members in, I'm not suggesting that that's 20 family members, but I would know that there's maybe one or two people who for the last you know, five years have been going regularly to visit a sister or a, you know, a brother or a family member. 
and they now have to choose when both of them probably kit it out well, following the rules and the examples, will do very, very well in supporting the home and supporting the resident. And I think we, I, I think we owe it to everyone to at least try it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go on then to Alan. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just, um, the Chair had referenced the presentation we got from the Professor in Hong Kong a few weeks ago, and just some uh, interesting statistics that he gave us that they certainly did uh, a very good job in controlling uh, the number of deaths in the care homes. Uh, and their, the average uh, residency uh, in their homes was around about 100, so they're all, all quite, quite big homes. But the, uh, one of the interesting uh, facts he gave us was that there was no health worker had actually contracted the virus in a healthcare sector. And the other very surprising thing was that they weren't doing, at that point, they weren't doing any testing at all in care homes or care home staff. I, I, I'm quite surprised about that. But what they did have that we wouldn't have was they had a bespoke isolation unit. And as soon as they, there was any sort of an outbreak in a nursing home, it was just everybody was lifted lock, stock and barrel and taken to that isolation hospital or, or unit, whatever you want to call it, for two or three weeks before they would return back uh, to, to their home, which obviously would have had a deep clean. But if I could maybe ask the Commissioner, but prior to the, uh, the pandemic breaking out here, um, would care homes have carried a residual stock of infection controlled PPE um, just to cope with the sort of uh, gastric uh, outbreaks and infections and stuff. And how long would that stock normally have been, uh, would have lasted for? Would he have carried a month's stock or just a couple of weeks' stock? And prior again to the outbreak uh, of the pandemic, would staff have been routinely uh, fully trained? in um, infection control uh, and would that training have been kept up to date on, on, a, on a sort of a regular basis? Thank you. Yes, well certainly my understanding of um, and certainly most of the homes who follow the RQIA regulations will follow the, the, the procedures and the requirements for staff to be trained uh, in infection control uh, on a very regular basis, and that will be part of the inspection of, of obviously of records and training records. In addition to that, the stockpiling of PPE, I think nursing and care homes and indeed the ancillary sector, and indeed as all, probably were in the exact same position as hospitals. That there's, you know, we, we you know, organisations keep a stock, but certainly I don't think any organisation, and, and we see that from the fact that the gaps that are in our hospital services, that there was not enough per se at the beginning to support everyone. And we, at that time, I know in terms of our commentary, felt that the, the eye of everyone was on making sure that hospitals were fully supported, fully kitted out um, and had everything directed to it. And I think at that point, there is a recognition that um, care models, whether they be care in people's homes, because people at home don't stockpile PP either. You know, care in people's homes and care in nursing and, and residential homes, the amounts of PP stock that was needed there was certainly not at the levels it should have been, um, as they weren't at the levels they were needed in hospitals. But certainly my understanding at the minute is that they are, uh, in terms of the supply chain, it's working very well and trusts are delivering that to every home on a weekly basis. Um, is that enough? Uh, you know, I think we've got we've all got to be ready for the fact that we may we may need to increase numbers again and and sort of stockpile more. But at the moment, the system that's in place, and it's my understanding from feedback, that the system that the trust has delivering out is working. But I think we need to be agile of foot if that needs to increase. But that's you know hospitals, people in care and people's homes, and people in the residential facilities as well. Prior to the pandemic, would the inspection regime have required a nursing home uh, to demonstrate that they did have uh, a supply of uh, PPE available immediately uh, to cope with any uh, local infections that the home may have suffered? 
Well, my understanding that would have been certainly one of, in terms of infection control and the measures for infection control in terms of uh, normal, I say normal illnesses when I mean sort of like sickness and bugs and things like that, there would have been the uh, requirement to make sure that people were appropriately um, uh, masks and uh, aprons and gloves um, prior to COVID. I think the intensity of COVID meant that the actual numbers was increased and indeed the increase was also in terms of the type of PPE because for many homes it had to go to the, the highest level of PPE which I think would not have been the required, certainly the required standard um, prior to that and I think that those levels of the the higher um, standard, you know, in terms of for actual COVID outbreaks, um, is the one that we need to make sure um, is in place now going forward. Thank you, thank you. Any any comment or commissioner? Any comments there in terms of that uh, section that you want to make? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to point out, um, Chair, that I mean, I think the supply of PP is obviously very important. Um, it then homes would have had a limit, limited supply at the beginning of this, but nobody was, you know, fully ready for the pandemic. And it's very clear that at the start, many homes felt left behind in this, and many homes didn't have the, the support and the supplies that they needed. And it took many weeks before we got to a situation when that was the case. Now, that thankfully seems to be um, much better the last number of months, but I think it's important to point out that that was. A major problem at the beginning and it's one that we can't take a eye off you know i think going forward we need to make, make sure now that there is that security of supply going forward so we're not running low on ppe that we are able to up the testing regime and we're not you know i think it's if you look at the evidence it's very clear that older people living in care homes are the most at risk group um, and therefore they should be prioritized um, and i think another point to make in the testing regime um, is that the, the care workers in care homes are are in what's called the pillar two testing regime, so they're not in the same uh, regime as other health workers in hospital settings, and I think that's something that needs to be looked at as well. And um, these people are key workers in frontline roles, and I think they need to be um, test. They need to be seen as priority uh, in terms of testing. Okay, thank you, Commissioner, and and I think that pillar two is where there there have been other issues arising in terms of uh, access to testing or late return of testing, so that's interesting as well. And um, we'll go now finally to Alex uh, for a question. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned about staff getting tested every fourteen days. Does that apply to agency staff as well? To your knowledge, is my first question. The second question is a bit more difficult, and it's something I haven't got my head around yet. Um, in terms of residents getting COVID in nursing homes, uh, and, and the ones that have unfortunately passed away, we see a significant amount of them actually passing away in the nursing home. Now, this is where I can't get my head around. If, if those residents are that ill, why aren't they being taken to the hospital? Or is there some sort of is the hospital coming to them? Or what way is that working? Why why aren't they going straight to the hospital, if you know what I mean, and, and put into intensive care? What way is that work to the best of your knowledge? Thank you. Thank you. And over to everyone. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, um, in terms of testing, I mean, the testing is for all staff. Obviously, people will come and go, and if somebody's in for one day and, and out again and not back in that home, they won't be. But um, but the testing regime is for all staff who are who are regularly in a home. In terms of transition um, uh, to hospital, I mean, I think um, you know Linda has pointed out that the, the level of care that people can get now in care homes is very high, actually. Um, and actually, even before the pandemic, homes would be dealing with, you know, very serious infections, very serious conditions, and would tr try to treat people as much as they possibly can. But it would, there, you know, we have received, um, you know, guarantees that if a clinician deemed that the person uh, was um, unwell enough that they would need to be treated in the hospital setting, they would be moved. Um, but you know, I think what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic as well was um, it. 
it, it's not a nice position to be in to be moved to hospital either because one of the terrible things about this um, coronavirus is that you are isolated once you go to hospital you don't have family or people that you know around you as well so it's it's something that's not taken lightly if the person can be treated in the home that will be the first attempt but if deemed that they should be transferred to hospital um, they will be um, and unfortunately we saw that in the figures as well and um, that many people uh, who died in the first phase of this actually were care home residents but actually passed away in hospital settings okay thank you Thank you. Um, Linda, do you want to say anything in relation to that part? Just probably just to follow on from what uh, the Commissioner has said there, that there are very, very good end of life care pathways for residents now. Um, it would have been in the past that there would have been this push to get people into hospitals. But what we recognised, and a lot of work has been done through PHA and the trusts, in terms of making sure that those pathways meant that the quality of life at the at the end of life was such that um, you'd be able to, to die uh, you know peacefully at home in the nursing or residential home um, was the preferred option so absolutely my knowledge I, I certainly don't have my knowledge of anyone stopped from going to hospital if they needed to be there for a particular reason but certainly um, you know GPs or the clinicians um, along with the home and families, have always worked very well to make sure that end of life care is a quality and um, has human rights around it. So, um, it, most people, I have to say, in terms of our experiences at that period, would prefer to stay at home. Um, and you know, the support going in with, from nursing staff uh, in the trust, and, and I, I understand that has happened and does happen. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple of wee quick just clarification questions for each of you, and then and then maybe just another another final one. But uh, just to clarify, uh, Linda, when you had spoke about the family cures and the family cures committee in relation to PPE and visiting and donning and doffing, were you suggesting that family cures could play a role in terms of organising and providing you know that type of support and training to take the pressure off the homes in terms of donning and doffing? And, and visiting in that in that sense, I uh, well they would play the role uh, chair in terms of once they are trained and making sure that they have the necessary um, and adequate training skills in terms of knowing how to don and off. And I mean we're all we, we we can learn that very quickly. You know that can be done with the help of the infection control nurses that are going in and out of homes at the minute training care staff. Um, but you know the, the the nurse manager could train. Um, a couple of the, the, the family members who really want to be involved in supporting the home and making sure that they understand the importance of PPE, the importance of using it, going and doffing correctly. And then they would be able to monitor the families coming in and out. And the families coming in and out of a visiting room, it's not into the full home where all the rest, you know, it's into the piece where most most homes have a designated room which is um, you, you um, checked beforehand and checked after a visit. And that role, I think, is a very positive role that families, many, many families would welcome, certainly in the feedback that I've had. But the role of training would, in the first instance, come from the trained specialists. Thank you. And, um, Commissioner, just in relation to the discharge policy, and you had said in the earlier part of your presentation that no one should be discharged in with a positive or awaiting the result of a test. Have you had any discussions with the department on that or received any assurances that that will be the case, given we're going into a worrying second surge? And given, and I note also very worryingly, the care home infections has gone from 25 to 35 to 45 currently, so almost double within a short space of weeks. So have you had any, uh, either of you, had any communication in regard to that policy? Uh, Chair, there was communication about that actually uh, fairly early on in this pandemic and we did seek those assurances and uh, my understanding then was the policy was introduced at all that nobody would be placed in a care home until they received a, neg a negative uh, COVID test. So I understand that is that's still the case and obviously must still be the case going forward. Okay. Thank you. And then just to kind of to kind of wrap up, both of you had indicated that in terms of the guidance, it was published a couple of weeks ago, um, and and uh, that there were some useful elements of it. But both of you said there were some issues. Would you like to just advise the committee what the issues were 
in that guidance from your perspective, please. I'll take, I'll take you each in turn. I'll maybe go to Linda first and then finish with yourself, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, it's just to say, I suppose, to wrap the, the one point I, I probably want to come back to is, is in the type of, gui- of, the type of visiting. Um, we need guidance, uh, absolutely, and we support the work that has been done to get the guidance out because it's a very challenging environment that we're in. But, you know, from feedback that we've got, I think that there's an opportunity for the judgment piece and the compassion piece around perhaps more than one, one designated um, family member. And perhaps that one hour could be designated down into maybe two half hours um, for for very frail older people, particularly older people with dementia. A couple of visits a week would make such a difference, but we recognise that that has to be appropriately managed and, and monitored, and that's where we think that support could come in from um, a really confident uh, relatives committee in each home. Thank you, and uh, Commissioner. Then, what what would your key issues be in relation to the current guidance? Um, yes, Chair, I mean, I would agree with what Linda said there. I, I think the challenges are, I think the guidance itself, guidance itself um, on paper um, is, is, is good in the sense that it, it allows the flexibility and allows individual uh, risk assessments. I think the difficulty is the implementation of it, the practicalities of it, the, the extra help that, that care homes need to introduce it. I agree with Linda that families have a key role here. Um, in working with the homes, um, and my concern is we are in this now. We are, you know, in the mouth of a second wave, and we don't have the time to, you know, to do lots of planning. We need to come up with practical solutions that put in place um, a safe environment, um, but also work with families, work with providers, work with the authorities to come up with conditions that allow for some safe form of visiting. I think the care partner. Um, idea is good but again I think that's something that went on a lot before the COVID where families played a really key role in supporting the homes. I think it, it becomes very difficult to introduce that to any high degree um, but just because of the, 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 the scale of this and the threat and the, the amount of work that has to go in. But people have to work together, the homes need to be supported, the families have to be listened to. I think um, the committee will find that you know the testimonies of the family uh, Family is powerful as part of this, and I, I do welcome the fact that the committee has announced this inquiry, and I also welcome the fact that there's a quick turnaround because we do need decisions quickly on this. And the issues that come up, we're doing our best to work with the authorities to highlight them. Um, but we really all are in this together, and we do need to work through this if we're going to try to protect older people in care homes and also give them uh, some quality of life. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you both for your presentations this morning and for your answers and your input into the committee's inquiry. It's very welcome and we do look forward to your fuller uh, submissions that you've both indicated there. Um, so we appreciate your time and effort in relation to all of that. We look forward to hearing from you again in more detail. But for now, on behalf of the committee, just to wish you both all the best and your organisations in terms of the work that you are doing with this crucial sector. So my thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you now. Okay, members. So we are just um, in any other business really? Is we we have a single item agenda today? So any other business? No. So then, can I just advise members that the date, time, and place of our next meeting will be on Thursday, the fifteenth of October, in the Senate Chamber, beginning at nine thirty a.m. Thank you, members. Okay. Yeah, thanks.